also encourage you if you have a labor nurse or somebody who you're like, oh my gosh, this person above and beyond. So fabulous, so amazing. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Elizabeth, also known as Nurse Zabe here on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. I am a labor and delivery nurse, postpartum nurse, certified childbirth educator, and mom to three. And today's video, I'm gonna be answering some of y'all's questions because since I've been back on YouTube and posting more kind of on all my socials, I'm getting some really great and fabulous questions from you guys that I like to just kind of compile over time. I'm hoping to do one of these every month, every couple of months, compiling all the questions that I'm getting in my comment section and giving you guys some evidence-based answers. Today, we're gonna to touch a little bit on breastfeeding, on bleeding in labor and when that becomes worrisome. We're gonna to touch a little bit on grand multips or somebody who has had a lot of babies and how their labor might look different and a few other things. You wanna learn some things with me? Let's keep watching. And of course, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments and we will start answering those in our next Q&A. first question that I have comes from somebody who is not planning on breastfeeding. Is it possible to keep your milk from coming in if you have no plans on breastfeeding? Now for those planning on not breastfeeding, I do have a video on formula feeding, but I want to touch base on things that you can do to help decrease the intensity of your milk coming in. There are ways that we can lessen your milk coming in, but there is nothing specifically that we can do to stop your milk coming in because your milk coming in is caused by a hormone change that happens with birth. Your baby comes out and then you deliver your placenta. Your placenta was giving you high levels of estrogen and progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. That is gone. We see this big old plummet and that plummet tells your body, hey, let's make some milk. So your body during your pregnancy is going to be making colostrum starting as early as like 16 weeks. And then once that placenta comes out, that will stimulate your body to go on to lactogenesis two and bring in your mature milk about three to five days after delivery of baby. Things that help your mature milk come in faster that we're gonna avoid are things like nipple stimulation. And this does not just mean obviously putting your baby on the breast and allowing them to suckle, but also think about like when you're in the shower, not letting the hot water be down on your chest, making sure that you're wearing a nice tight sports bra so that we don't have loose fabrics stimulating our nipples in any way. Cold is also going to be helpful in relieving discomfort so you can use ice packs on your breast. And actually another cold thing that works oddly enough is cabbage leaves. So we don't want 100% know why cabbage leaves help with engorgement, which is the feeling of your breast being really, really full with milk. Some thoughts are that maybe it absorbs the extra fluid in the tissue that's making your breast feel full, but it can definitely be beneficial. So what you'll do is put your cabbage leaves in the fridge, take out some of those inner cabbage leaves, kind of like give it a little massage like you would with kale before eating and put that in your bra for about 30 minutes next to your breast and then you can change them out periodically as needed. There's actually a cream called Cabo Cream that you can purchase for similar effects, but it's like $15 and a head of cabbage is, depending on where you live, like two to $5, so that might be your cheaper, better alternative. Also for discomfort, you can definitely take some ibuprofen and Tylenol. And of course, if you have a red hot spot on your breast, if you're noticing that you're getting flu-like symptoms, definitely something that I want you to reach out to your OB about because even though you are not putting the baby to the breast and you probably are not gonna have issues with mastitis, definitely something that I want you to be aware of the symptoms for. And a mastitis is just breast infection due to the stasis of milk in the breast. Our next question on here is, hi Nurse Dave, I'm due soon and wondering if you have any experience working with moms who have implants over the muscle. So there are two ways to do breast implants, under the muscle or over the muscle. And if you are younger and considering breast implants, one thing that you might want to consider for those who are hoping to breastfeed babies in the future, if that's something that you're thinking about in the moment, and of course, sometimes things in plans change, 
under the muscle is going to in general be the method that we recommend and that is because having a breast implant over the muscle can be more likely to damage the ducts and put pressure on the breast similar to when your breasts are engorged and so it can be hard for your body to know hey are my breasts full of milk and that's actually my cue to make less milk or is this a breast implant because of the similar feeling of fullness that happens when we do breast implants. Now here is the thing with breastfeeding that I think is so important. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Now when I'm working with patients in the hospital and they have implants over the muscle and they want to try and breastfeed, that's definitely something that we still can do. We can have great bonding, we can have some colostrum and some milk going to baby, even if you're not able to develop a full and robust milk supply. There are even ways where we can help baby to latch onto the breast and give supplemental nursing through a small syringe that's placed in baby's mouth attached to a bottle or some vessel to hold milk that is allowing your baby to nurse at the breast to utilize that system but still get extra milk in addition to what you're producing. The other thing to consider if you're hoping to breastfeed and get implants or if you're thinking about implants is even if when we place them under the muscle that does not necessarily mean that there might not be the potential for damage to the milk ducts, damage to the passageways for the milk to get to the areola during surgeries. Avoiding incisions around the areola, really going under the breast and in the armpit, probably beneficial, and they can't guarantee a full supply anytime that they're doing surgery on the breast. So this would also include breast reduction. But you can still breastfeed your baby, you can still provide breast milk to your baby, you can still get great benefits from breast milk, even if it is supplemented with formula or donor milk and it's not all coming directly from your breast. We have a lot of ways that we can encourage that bond if that's something that feels good and strong and important to you. So our next question is, hi Nurse Sabe, can you do a video on goodies nurses will appreciate in a grab and go basket? And yes, I can. So ever since COVID, general food that is going to be preferred by nurses and by your healthcare professionals is probably something that is pre-packaged, not something that you made from home, even though I know that you probably made it with all the love and caring in the world. Granola bars, nuts, candy, I'm, I'm gonna say it, candy, gum, chapstick, pens, hair ties, all fabulous in a grab and go basket, all things that we definitely can and will use on the unit. I also encourage you if you have a labor nurse or somebody who you're like, oh my gosh, this person above and beyond, so fabulous, so amazing. Consider writing a Daisy Award nomination if that's something that's available at their hospital. Literally just Google your hospital name and Daisy Award. It will come up and basically that's a way that you can write a letter being like, you're amazing, thank you for everything that you did. And they get the letter, right? and their manager gets the letter and they might even win an award it means a lot to the nurses to feel recognized in that way but we of course will never say no to candy gum and hair ties but don't feel overwhelmed and also don't feel like you have to bring anything for your nurses like we are we're there and we love you we love you and we love taking care of you and we love getting little treats right who doesn't love a little treat but we're also getting paid for our job you are paying your hospital bill, which is paying us, which is how we are able to do it. So oh, I'm there for you because I love you so much. Um, I also am getting money, so you do not have to bring anything, but we love if you do as well. I have another question here. I have a question. Why, when it was time to push, they stopped the epidural? From not feeling anything, I went to I feel it all. First of all, I'm really, really sorry that that happened, especially if that happened in a way where you were like not asked if this was okay, not consulted, not part of that decision-making process. Here's the thing about epidurals. They are lovely tools 
to help decrease our sensations of labor. There are times when our epidurals work so well, and one might even argue too well. So it's normal with an epidural that it can increase the duration of pushing by about 30 minutes, especially with your first baby. But there might be times when you are having a really hard time figuring out where to push and pushing and using good effort to bring your baby down and out. Then we are figuring out and towing this fine line of if we turn this epidural off or down, and if we do that, it's not instantaneous. It's gonna take a few hours for you to fully start to feel everything. But if we turn this off or down, okay, we still need you to be, have enough pain control that you're able to push. So it should not be standard of practice that as soon as it's time for you to start pushing, your provider comes in with no consult to you and turns off the epidural. That's not okay. It might be after a little bit of pushing, you guys have a conversation. Hey, baby's not really moving. Could we turn the epidural down or off so that you can gain back a little bit of sensation? But again, we're towing that fine line, right? Because we don't want you to get so painful that you can't push. I also have had people get painful during pushing and we get an epidural bolus and now they're pushing so much better, right? So it's that very fine line. I was one of those people with my first birth. I needed an epidural bolus while I was pushing because I could not push because I had a hot spot where I was just feeling everything and it was miserable. The other option potentially, depending on what's going on, is considering laboring down, which is where we, instead of pushing when you're fully dilated and not yet feeling that urge to push and, and having a hard time coordinating those efforts, we use strategic position changes to help your body naturally continue to bring baby down and then we wait to push for maybe an hour or two. Now the other thing with epidurals is sometimes we still will feel more as we get to the pushing stage and pressure is a big sensation that we feel because our epidural works super super well from our belly button to our pubic bone but that pressure sensation as baby's coming down in the pelvis might be a little bit more difficult for our epidural to completely cover. So our next question also has to do with pushing. What happens if my baby gets stuck in the birth canal? So during the pushing stage, that second stage of labor, you're bearing down, you're giving it your all. Maybe your baby isn't really moving, even though you're pushing in the exact right spot. Depending on where your baby is in your pelvis, your provider will probably have a conversation with you after pushing for a few, maybe even three, four hours that they are concerned about an arrest of descent, which basically means that your baby is not descending further into the pelvis and coming into the outside world. If your baby is still relatively high in the pelvis, then the conversation will probably be more geared toward moving towards a cesarean birth or an abdominal birth or a surgical birth, right? A C-section. I choose to highlight the word birth with those because you're still giving birth to your baby. You're still a complete and total rock star. If your baby is low enough in the pelvis and maybe just needs a little extra help or guidance, they might talk to you about considering an instrumental birth, which would be forceps or a vacuum depending on what your provider prefers to use. Forceps are almost like tongs, salad tongs that kind of go on either side of your baby's head. A uh, vacuum is going to be right on here on the back of their head. They're gonna discuss with you the risks and the benefit of these versus a cesarean birth. And then you're gonna figure out what sounds best and right for you. So with an instrumental birth, you are still going to give 100% of what you were giving with your pushing efforts. And really your provider's just going to use the forceps or the vacuum to help guide your baby down and out and there is still a chance that those might be unsuccessful and we still need to consider and heading towards the cesarean birth route. With the cesarean birth, if your baby is super, super low into your pelvis, your provider might be concerned that they will get through the layers of the skin, muscle, fascia, uterus down to your baby and they're almost gonna be kind of like suctioned and wedged down deep into your pelvis and they might have a more difficult time helping to get your baby's head out and deliver them through your incision. We might need to discuss uh, a way that we can help push your baby's head up and kind of almost break that suction cup seal. There's actually this really cool device that my facility just got called a fetal pillow that actually is inserted through the vagina and will go underneath the baby's head and help get your baby's head unstuck from the birth canal if it's super, super low. Other option is something called a push-up where your nurse or another provider, another doctor goes in with a sterile gloved hand and uses their hand to push up gently on the baby's head to kind of help break that suction and that seal. My next question, 
Is it normal to bleed like a lot during cervical checks? One of the students, nurses slash doctors checked on my cervix around seven centimeters and it was so painful and her glove was covered in blood. Just wondering if that's normal, something I might expect with this next delivery. What do we know about the cervix? The cervix is the neck of the uterus. It's going back behind your baby's head for your cervix to fully dilate, for that cervix to get out of the way so that your baby can be born through your bearing down efforts. And also that cervix is super, super vascular. So it is not uncommon for there to be bleeding. This is known as bloody show. A little bit of blood, sometimes bright red or pink or brown, mixed into the mucus as you are laboring. When your provider goes in and performs a cervical exam, right, and they are touching and manipulating that cervix, and maybe it's set at seven centimeters, they were trying to figure out what position baby was in, that can make a little bit more bleeding happen. There might be some bleeding on the pad underneath of you, not a whole lot, but you can imagine, right, if we have mucus and amniotic fluid perhaps too on a glove and then there's bleeding too and we bring that glove down, there's going to look like perhaps there's a lot more blood. Now, when do we need to be concerned about bleeding in your labor? If you are bleeding, bright red bleeding, and it is like a menstrual period, that's a lot of blood, that's too much bleeding. If you're ever at home and you're concerned about bleeding during your labor, I want you to call your provider, I want you to go in and get assessed. What are kind of our differentials when somebody comes in bleeding? A lot of it has to do with the placenta. So has the placenta in some way come away from the wall of the uterus? So if that happens before your baby's born, then the blood that would be normally going to baby is gonna be coming out through the vagina, and that's called a placental abruption. Things that we know that can cause or be risk factors for abruption are things like trauma to your belly, right, if you fell directly on your belly, cocaine use in pregnancy, heavy smoking, severe hypertension in pregnancy, right, anything that's going to affect the vasculature of that placenta. If your placenta is really close to the cervix, or even covering the cervix, that's known as the placenta previa, which we would see on ultrasound, but that can put us at risk for bleeding too in labor. And if we have a placenta previa or a placental abruption, those would both be indications for a cesarean birth. But vaginal bleeding with a cervical exam, probably just that cervix dilating, opening, and being super vascular. So my next question has to do with grand mal tips, which is somebody who's had five or more births. Would you ever consider touching on your experience helping with grand mal tips to deliver? I'm sure they're all different and you know there are specific associated risks and I'm very curious if there's any surprising trends you've noticed among them, like the length of labor, pain management, preference, or even just how often you see them in your particular hospital. It's a great question. We don't see them a ton, but I can think of a handful that I have helped with. So when you have had five or more pregnancies, and you have given birth to five or more babies, what we tend to see is that these babies in the subsequent pregnancies, even though you might feel like baby's getting really low, stay pretty high up until labor. And what I mean is that they don't descend into the pelvis as early as they would when it's, when it's your first baby. I think that this is in general due to all of the muscles, all of the ligaments, everything that ho was holding the uterus in place, getting stretched out over all these pregnancies, right? I know I've had three births and my abs are not what they used to be. So babies tend to hang up higher for a little bit longer. This can lead to maybe some more start and stop labor, prodromal labor, really where the body is focusing on getting the baby into the pelvis. But what I have noticed is that once these babies get into the pelvis, it's lock and load go time. They get into that pelvis, often waters break, and then like we have a baby two seconds after that. So the active phase of labor, the getting started can take a little bit of time. There is a move from spinning babies that can be particularly helpful with this. It's the abdominal lift and tuck, where basically you stand up straight. You could have your partner behind you or even do it next to a wall. You do a posterior pelvic tilt, which is gonna open up the top part of the pelvis. And then underneath your belly, you lift up and hold in through 10 contractions. Things can go from zero to 60 incredibly quickly, but that sometimes it takes a little bit of time. So our risks associated with grand mal tips are actually two of the things I literally have just discussed. Fetal malpositioning or 
abnormal fetal presentation, right? So that baby maybe is breech or transverse, right? They are just having a hard time finding their way into the pelvis. And then also precipitous delivery, that once they find their way, they get locked and loaded and go quickly. The other thing that me as your healthcare provider in labor is going to be extra aware of is your risk for postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony, which means that your uterus, this muscle that's supposed to clamp down so that the wound where the placenta was does not bleed too much after birth, has a hard time doing that. It's a little bit tired. So what are we gonna have ready is our postpartum hemorrhage medications. We are definitely going to highly recommend a saline lock or a small hub IV in your arm. We actually have a really cool new thing at our hospital called the Jada, which is a system that actually inserts this really flexible catheter circle into your uterus and we put it on low suction and, and physically makes the uterus contract around it as an option for postpartum hemorrhage. We're just going to kind of be aware of all of these things. We're going to be mindful and trying to think two, three, four steps ahead while also helping you to bond with your baby, snuggle with your baby, initiate breastfeeding if that's your goal. When babies are born very quickly, when they come under the pubic bone very quickly, we expect babies to maybe be a little bit spittier, maybe need a little bit more suctioning after delivery, maybe have some bruising on their face, all super common and normal things. Okay, so those were all the questions that I collected for this month. Definitely, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, leave them down below. Let me know what you're thinking. Maybe let me know what other videos you are asking, hoping for me to make, because I would love to make those for you. And until next time, bye guys.